Welcome to Iterations at the New Bedford Free Public Library, on view summer 2024. During this tour, we will explore the question, what is an original work of art? And we will discuss how a painting can transform when it's presented in a different medium, scale, or context. Throughout, we will reference works on display in the third floor gallery and elsewhere in the library. Often when an artist embarks on a large painting, they may paint a smaller version first to work out things like perspective and composition, which are much easier to modify in smaller scale. These early versions are called studies, and they can sometimes reveal information about the artist's process. The artists themselves may not have considered to study a complete work of art on its own, and that often influenced how they treated it. On display here, in a space adjacent to where the final piece hangs, is a study for the spar by Clement Nye Swift. We know that Swift painted this study, though it is not signed, because there is a photograph of him doing so, but oftentimes this is not the case. Before delivering the spar to the library, Swift wrote to the trustees that he would like to unvarnish the painting and make some changes to the group of people, though these were never carried out as the trustees became impatient with Swift and asked to take the painting as it was. This fiddling with an image which the artist had previously considered complete enough to varnish seems very in line with this meticulously painted and finished study, which could be a standalone work of art. Albert Bierstadt is probably the most well-known painter in the library's art collection. During Bierstadt's career, he traveled with government survey teams as they explored the American West creating sketches and having photographs taken as he went. This way, when he returned to his studio, he would be able to use these reference materials to create his monumental canvases. The library's Sunset Light Wind River Range of the Rocky Mountains was painted in 1861, and two years later, Bierstadt used some of the same reference images to create the Rocky Mountains Landers Peak, after which a print was made by James David Smiley. So then we could classify the print on display here as a copy of a later version of an original painting, but consider the engraving process Smiley would have used. In order to create this print, Smiley would have had to have drawn a copy of the painting, then transferred that drawing to a metal plate, which is engraved by hand. Every step in this process not only allows for artistic interpretation, but requires it. The artist must translate the tones and color variations of a painted surface into simple black lines without losing the texture and depth of the original. The overall effect is somewhat flattened in the print, but Smiley is able to capture a remarkable amount of tonal variation and detail and makes viewing this print an entirely unique experience from its painted counterpart. Caroline Amelia Powell was an Irish printmaker working in Massachusetts. On display here are her printing blocks for the Three Marys and Christ and Mary Magdalene, which represent the best surviving record of the murals painted by John Lafarge in the chancel of Old St. Thomas Church in Manhattan, which were lost in the fire that destroyed the church in 1905. A note attached to the Three Marys says, made by Miss C. A. Powell with the permission and partial supervision of Mr. Lafarge. This means that these were created contemporaneously and that Lafarge had some input or approval of their final design. He even signed the prints created from these blocks alongside Powell. This kind of collaboration between painter and printmaker is not entirely unusual, and there are some cases historically where an artist may work semi-exclusively with one printmaker or engraver to copy their work because they trust their artistic ability. From what photographs remain of the murals in situ, it is very difficult to discern any details or differences that may exist between the murals and prints. Probably the most significant change for the viewer of these images is scale. The original murals were around eight to nine feet tall and folded around the chancel space in a way that evoked a great shrine or reliquary according to an 1878 review in the New York Times. In contrast, prints made from these blocks would be small and intimate they draw you closer to examine little details rather than demanding you step back and take in the whole effect. 
This photogravure reproduction of the black sheep by Francis Davis Millet was made by the Berlin Photographic Company, one of the many photogravure and lithography companies which reproduced famous and contemporary works of art for use in study collections and display. This allowed working or middle-class families to own and display art in their homes that they otherwise couldn't afford and provided materials for institutions like schools and libraries to use as teaching and research aids. Because it was created from a photograph, this print reveals some of the details in the painting that are difficult to see in a larger image, which hangs directly above this display. The photogravure process does not require an artist to copy a work by hand, and no individual artist is credited with making this print. William Allen Wall was primarily a portrait artist, but this may be his most well-known work. This image has had several names, and there are multiple versions of the same painting. At the New Bedford Whaling Museum, you can find New Bedford in 1807, a painting with a few key differences that make it unique from the library's old four corners, after which the print by Charles Tabor was made and titled New Bedford 50 years ago. Tabor's lithograph was immensely popular locally and can still be found in New Bedford antique shops today. Anecdotally, many visitors to the library remark that they recognize the painting from a print that they or their family owns and displays in their home. We know that Tabor's print was made after the library's version of the painting because of the aforementioned differences, most notably the two men standing against the yellow building in the bottom right corner, which are not present in the other painting. Tabor's print was originally made as a lithograph, hand-drawn after the painting, and most were hand-colored or tinted, though this copy is a colotype reproduction. Like with Smiley's engraving, Tabor had to use his own artistic skill and judgment to recreate this image by hand. Interestingly, there's a faint grid visible in the yellow area of the sky in the library's painting, which would help to facilitate accurate copying. Throughout the library's collection, you may find additional original works of art on display year round. These include a copy of the Italian Renaissance painter Correggio, a partial cast of the famous Venus de Milo, and two copies of J.M.W. Turner's Paintings of Venice done by the local artist Louisa Dolwyn Ricketson during her time studying the masters in Europe. In the meeting room, you can find a copy of the famous portrait of John James Audubon by John Simey, and a large copy of the Monroe Lennox portrait of George Washington by Gilbert Stuart, a very frequently reproduced painting that has copies all over the country, the original artist having made three himself. So as we reflect on the work we've seen, we must return to our larger question, what is an original work of art? We've explored how different mediums or scales may change an image significantly enough to consider it unique, but are these copies original? All were made by a real person, and that person had to make choices to create a new work of art. But they did not create the idea, the image, its composition, its meaning or message. So regardless of if we can consider the merit of the work from a technical standpoint, on a deeper level, it's near impossible to consider the work divorced from the original context. Louisa Rickardson may have painted a compelling copy of Turner's Venice. It may be technically sound and accurate, but it will never be Ricketson's Venice. On the other hand, Powell and Lafarge worked together. His input was considered in the making of these blocks and the experience of viewing a print from them is so far removed from the original murals that it may as well be its own work of art. Swift and Wall fit into our discussion about originality in an interesting way. Both painted multiple versions of the same image and here we can't say that another artist is reinterpreting their work, but which of their paintings is the original? The one that was painted first, since all others are technically copies? The one that was painted last because it's the definitive version? Both? Originality matters in the art world. Original works demand more prestige and higher price tags. And on a larger scale, originality is what brings us forward and what creates new movements in art. Thank you for joining us on this tour of iterations. We hope it has been informative and thought-provoking and that you join us again for future exhibits.